Welcome back to Small Business Big Lessons, a Buffer original series. My name is Ash Reed, Head of Content at Buffer, and throughout this series, we're going on a journey to understand how great work happens. We're telling stories of unique businesses and meeting the incredible people behind them, examining how they're doing things differently and what we can learn from their journeys. Zingerman's has become an institution in the town of Ann Arbor, Michigan, and it's hard to describe exactly what Zingerman's is. On the surface, it's a collection of food-related businesses, each with its own speciality, all located in the Ann Arbor area. But if you dig a little deeper, you'll realize that Zingerman's is an incredibly unique business. In fact, Inc. Magazine once named it the coolest small business in America. And it was the inspiration behind Bo Burlingham's book, Small Giants. There are hundreds of things that make Zingerman's unique. From the fact its founders rejected traditional growth formulas to its focus on community giving and being a good corporate citizen. But today, we're going to focus in on open book management and how Zingerman's commitment to sharing as much information as possible with everyone in the organization has helped its community of businesses to thrive. My name is Ari. I'm from Zingerman's Community of Businesses in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Before Ari Weinzweig co-founded Zingerman's with Paul Saginaw in 1982, he was a regular college graduate looking for a job, any job, to pay his rent. Getting involved in the food industry was a happy accident. One of my roommates was waiting tables in a restaurant in downtown Ann Arbor, and so I went in there and applied for a job as a server like he had, and they offered me a job washing dishes, which I took, started that night, and that's how I got going. So I have no glamorous story about childhood dreams of cooking. I started to uh, prep, line cook, and manage kitchens. I worked for that restaurant group for about four years, and then in the fall of 1981, which now seems like the Middle Ages, I gave two months notice, not knowing what I was going to do next. Paul had left a few years earlier and opened this little, very high quality fish market here in town. And uh, he and I had talked over the years of doing our own thing together. And uh, he didn't know I had given notice, but he called me like two days later and he said there was this little building coming open across the street from the fish market that we should go check out. And March 15th, 1982 is when we opened the deli. From the very early days, Ari and Paul had a high-level vision for the kind of business they wanted to start. We knew from the beginning we wanted something unique. I really like originals. I'm drawn to people who create in a way that's true to who they are. And this is true in music. It's true in art. It's true in food. And I think there's a different energy around those kinds of places. So I knew that. We knew we wanted great food, great service, and a great place for people to work that we would employ. And from the beginning, uh, in the spirit of uniqueness, we knew we only wanted one. I never wanted multiple units uh, of the same thing. My experience of that everywhere in the world is the first one's awesome, the second one's not bad, the fourth one is fine, and the eighth one, it's like stopping at Starbucks, uh, which I'm not cutting on Starbucks. That's their vision, and they're entitled to go after what they want to do, but it just wasn't work I wanted to be part of. Zingerman's Deli was a hit. People would come from far and wide to try their famous sandwiches and experience the exceptional service. But with all of this success came pressure to grow the business. In 1993, uh, Paul sits me down on this little old wooden bench that's out front of the deli. And he kind of looks at me and he goes, okay, in 10 years, what are we doing? And I'm like, what? He's like, in 10 years, what are we doing? I'm like, I I don't know. (laughs) I haven't even thought about it. He's like, well, I mean, this is this crazy. Like, you know, we have this, we're not going to open in other cities and we're turning down offers. So we're losing money there. And then people are opening on campus and they're copying a lot of what we do because we won't go open there. I mean, is this crazy? Are we crazy? I'm like, dude, I don't know, but I got work to do. Like if I don't get back in there and get set up, we're going to get killed today. And he's like, no, this is our work. So in in hindsight, I, I realized he probably was barely sleeping for months worrying about this. And He had essentially an intuitive sense that we had fulfilled that original unwritten vision. And in essence, in our current language, what he was asking me is, what's your vision? And I really didn't have one. So we spent about a year of long walks, lots of cursing, arguing, eye rolling, coming back to the table, some laughing. And out of that is the first time that we wrote a vision in the format that we now write them regularly. As explored previously in the episode about Keep, the candle company, Visioning is the act of stepping back from the market and asking yourself questions like, what is it that I'm trying to build? What does it look like? How does it feel? 
And what impact does it have on the world? And essentially, it comes down to, instead of trying to solve problems, it's about coming at it from the heart and describing the future of your dreams. So out of that work, we wrote uh, what was called, and still is called, Zingerman's 2009. Uh, and we wrote this description of a community of businesses. So he really wanted to grow. I really wanted one place. And after a year of conversation, we came up with this idea that we could stay true to the having only the one original unique deli, but still grow by opening other Zingerman's businesses where they would have their own unique specialty. And that by doing that, we could create opportunity for people in the organization to become partners because I really wanted partners and owners on site who had a passion for what that business did. We really wanted somebody who was going to be in there baking for 20 or 30 years because achieving mastery is not a two-year process. It's for life, right? The community approach enabled Zingerman's to retain the best aspects of small business life, whilst also finding ways to grow and scale. Now, Zingerman's has over 10 businesses within its community, including the original deli that opened in 1982. They also have Zingerman's Roadhouse, a restaurant selling classic American food, and Zingerman's Bakehouse that makes traditionally baked breads and pastries. Along the way, Zingerman's became known for having a unique business model. And in 1994, they added a business to their community beyond the food industry called Zingtrain. Zingtrain helps other organizations build healthy work cultures and think differently about how they operate. They started teaching their philosophies about employee ownership, sustainable growth, and open book management. Paul and I learned about open books sometime in the mid 90s, so about 12, 13 years, 14 years into our business, uh, by reading the book, Great Game of Business, that Jack Stack and Bo Burlingham wrote. The Great Game of Business book led to a whole organization being formed to help business owners embrace the principles and practices of open book management. I'm Anne Claire Broughton. I'm based in Durham, North Carolina, USA. My company is Broughton Consulting, and we do open book management consulting with The Great Game of Business. They use sports metaphors, so in essence, the, the model is based on the belief, which I agree with, that most businesses, uh, the players, i.e. the staff, don't know how business works at all. Hence, they like it when it's slow because their day is easier, <laughs> which makes no sense to a business person. But if you don't know how business works, it's awesome. The quieter, the more other things you can get done. So with open book companies, we organize everything around a critical number. And a lot of times for first time practitioners, it's a profitability number. So we're trying to bring in more revenue and we're trying to manage expenses and do things in a smarter way so that we make more money. And when we make more money, that gain share goes into a bonus plan for everyone. So everyone is incentivized not only to create a great company, but actually to um, have a bonus. Most frontline people think the owners are making money like crazy, and I'm sure there are a few out there, but most people I know in business are barely making money, so they don't know the score, and then if the team wins or loses, they don't really get anything. This model is the inverse, which is we teach people how business works. We teach them the difference between cash flow and sales. We teach them the difference between cash flow and profit. They start to understand what depreciation is. They know how it's going. And so what starts to happen is if I walk into the business, they're excited when it's busy and they're bummed out when they're slow in the same way that a good team still loses, but they're unhappy about the fact that they lost. They're not going, oh, this is awesome. We don't get into the playoffs this year. My season's so much shorter, I can go camping. When it works well, the benefits of open book management can seep into every aspect of a business. It removes a lot of the traditional boss versus worker power dynamic and empowers employees within the company at any level to come up with ideas for improvements that benefit the whole enterprise. There's so many benefits. The number one benefit I would say is, you know that feeling when you set out to do something difficult with other people and you work really hard and you overcome obstacles and you do it. That's the best feeling in the world. And that's what we do every single day with open book companies. We've got everybody on board, everybody's pulling in the same direction, and you are tapping the ingenuity of every single person. A big piece of what we do is teach everybody 
to think like a leader, right? And, that, and not only teach them to, but expect them to act like a leader. And so this is something that we teach people from the beginning is like, there's things you understand on your third day that after 39 years of doing this, I'm clueless about. And so we need you to be able to participate in the conversation and open book allows everybody into the conversation. So instead of the typical hierarchical model where you'd have to be here, you know, seven years before you got in the meeting, you could be here seven days and you could raise your hand and say, like, I don't really think this makes sense. The other thing is that Gallup polls, engagement polls, show that only 13% of employees are engaged worldwide. So that's a huge waste. We spend so much of our time at work. Why not be excited, be engaged, be using our full brains to pull towards a common goal? You wouldn't play a game where you didn't know the score. If we were bowling and the vice president was behind a curtain with the pins and he would say to you, okay, a little to the left, a little to the right. Okay, very good. And you say, well, what's the score? And he says, well, I'll let you know at the end of the year. You wouldn't play a game that way. It's not fun. It's not motivating. We need to know the score. We play harder and we strategize better. Performance is better when people understand like the, the cost of what it means to drop something and break it. Like the average frontline employee in most organizations is like, whatever, man, they got so much money. Like, who cares if I drop 10 plates, like whatever. Whereas here, like they see how small the margins really are and they understand like you're not a bad human. I'm not going to yell at you for dropping them. I've dropped them too, but it does cost us money. And if we drop 10 plates a day by the end of the year, maybe it's $5,000. And if we need that 5,000 to both donate to the community, to pay out some small share of profit to, to the people working, et cetera, like none of that can happen. When employees understand how much it takes to make money, that's a big aha. A lot of times people think that a business is 40, 50% profitable and that the owner is going to the Cayman Islands every year and buying boats and things. And when they realize that it's hard to make money, we have a certain amount in revenue, but then we have a lot of expense. It costs money to make our product or service. And then we have other overhead expenses, administrative expenses and marketing expenses. And what's left, you know, that profit at the end of the day is is hard to come by and it's not that much. The average profitability of a company is six and a half percent. Some companies make more profit, you know, 10%, 20%. Some restaurants scrape by with one or two percent if they're lucky. The practical implementation of open book management revolves around transparency and ensuring everyone in the organization can see the bigger picture. Another key part of open book management is identifying targets and developing strategies to hit them. We need to know what the most important metrics are, and then we need to put them on a scoreboard. A scoreboard doesn't have to be a bunch of numbers. It's just a way of letting you know if you're winning or losing. And that's what we need to know. That's what's missing in business. So a scoreboard lets you know, are you winning? Are you losing? Who's accountable? And it gives you that chance to strategize. The other beating heart of open book management is the huddle. Our companies huddle every single week at the same time. They give big picture market conditions, then they go through the numbers, they highlight wins and losses, and how they're going to change those numbers. In order to make this process more engaging, it can be gamified, transforming what could have been a boring exercise in cost saving and efficiency into a fun and enjoyable experience. We will set a critical number for the year, and we huddle around that critical number every week. But we also know that there are many drivers to that critical number. So we might play a mini game just around changing one habit or going after one particular thing that's gonna make a big difference. And we also scoreboard that, we theme that, we have small, medium, and large milestones and small, medium, and large prizes. So one uh, mini game that I saw that I really liked was at New Belgium Brewing. They had a liquid center, which is their bar, and they were not selling enough. They just didn't have the good habits around selling. So they played a mini game. If somebody came in and ordered a fat tire, they would ask him if he wanted a case to take home or a t-shirt or something like that. So the scoreboard was a giant vinyl record with slices of orange peel on it. They wanted to go to a venue called the, the Orange Peel and hear music. And every time they brought in an additional 
4,700 or so in uh, profits, they were able to peel off a slice of orange. And then once all the orange peel was gone, they could win their prize and go hear music. There are countless examples of great ideas being generated by frontline staff who have spotted an issue in their area of focus. Issues that would have been missed by management or previously seen as trivial and unimportant prior to the implementation of open book management. There's a now famous example from Zingerman's Roadhouse that perfectly demonstrates these kinds of innovations. So it's kind of a perpetual problem, but in the beginning of any restaurant, waste is generally a particularly difficult uh, area of cost uh, management. So they were looking at their scoreboard, forecasting the month, and they said, our food costs are so high, what ideas do you have? And uh, one of the dishwashers said, you know what, I throw away so many french fries. Is it because they're bad? No, they're fabulous. It's just the portion's too big. So in the Huddle Live, we came up with, well, what if we cut the portion in half and offer free refills? It's a great example because it's win, win, win. You're spending less money. Everybody gets excited that they could get a free refill. And so the guy who washed the dishes had the best idea. It saved money for the business. Uh, It made the guest experience better and it raised the bar on quality. There are different levels of open book that companies can embrace depending on the way their business works. My company, Buffer, publishes all financial data, including salaries internally and externally. And while this particular practice is unusual, different businesses can tailor their use of open book to suit their needs. But the central concept is always to share the numbers that matter with all staff. So open book management is an operating system. Some companies do open book reporting, and that's great. It's great to know how we did last quarter or last year, and it's great to learn from past financials. But open book management is a system where everybody is taught the measures of business success and expected and enabled to act on them, to um, to actually promote the business. And the analogy with this is, if you knew your house was gonna burn down in two weeks, would you take different action than if it already burned down, right? You're able to take action, you know, during the month to prevent problems, to increase successes, and to get everybody thinking. So the really special thing about open book management is we build line of sight. So everybody knows how what they do every day affects the numbers. And this is one of the things that got me so excited about open book management years ago before I was a coach. I was at the conference and I heard from an IT guy at a, at a company. He did not directly produce the product or service, but once, and he didn't feel very important, but once he saw the numbers and he realized how much it cost for every hour that the computers were down, he got super engaged and he knew he was critical to success, but he didn't know that before. So... Open book and sharing those numbers is key. So I would suggest that open book is actually universally applicable. Uh, We use it in our training business. We use it in our cafe. We use it in our bakery. We use it in our mail order. And then we, you know, we use it in the restaurant. So it's, it's universally applicable. I mean, the metrics that are measured are changed always. That's part of the principle of it to fit what you're currently struggling with or what's important for your business. But it's, 100% applicable in in all settings, in my belief. Will it be used well in all settings? No, because it a lot depends on our ability as leaders to implement it. It affects on our ability to get buy-in. It's impacted by the willingness of the frontline staff to buy-in. If organizations, as I believe, are like ecosystems, not everything that you plant is going to work everywhere, but I think it can. It's just the farmer has to be prepared to do the work that needs to be done, and that is not as easy as it sounds. While the positive effects of open book management are clear to see, there are also some potential pitfalls to this practice that need to be taken into account to ensure success. Sometimes people will get excited about open book and implement it partway and then kind of lose interest. And that is terrible for morale because you've gotten people's hopes up. Like people want to be listen to. People want to give their ideas. And if you start to do it and then lose interest, that's awful for your morale. I believe very strongly that people who get to greatness, whether it's a poet, a professor, a restaurant, 
a, an athlete, a musician, they all have stuck with stuff long, long, long after that shiny newness wore off. And it's true with Open Book too. It takes a couple years at least to really have it go well. The use of Open Book helps everyone to feel engaged at work and to understand their impact. It's also instrumental in building trust between business owners and workers, an area that perhaps previously could be strained. It's definitely growing because if you think about how millennials and others want to be engaged from the beginning, um, it's the perfect system. Millennials don't want to come into a business and sort of pay their dues and be a cog and wait, wait, wait to have any authority. Like people want to be engaged. People want to know that their thoughts and ideas make a difference. So it's definitely getting a lot more attention. And if you think about the pace of global change, we cannot have top-down command and control organizations. We've got to have bottom-up participatory organizations. That's how we're going to get the innovation that's going to keep us competitive in global markets. So it is the way to do business, and it's fun. I, I still remember the year we opened, and this is when phones were attached to walls. So I, my grandmother called, and I answered the phone at home, and then she, she, we're talking for a minute, and she's like, well, wait a minute. If you're not there and you're open, who's watching the cash register? I'm not blaming her. It's just it's a negative belief about people. Like if you're not, the owner's not standing there looking at the money all day, somebody's going to steal. So if you have positive beliefs about people, like the more trust we put in people, the better they're going to behave. If you believe in diversity, then it tells you that the perspective of the dishwasher is as interesting and valuable as yours. It doesn't mean you just turn over your whole life and flip the roles around, but that you have conversations. If you believe that there's no better people or worse people, regardless of college degrees or titles, if you have beliefs like that, if you believe that the more generous we are, the better we're all going to do, then Open Book is a logical conclusion. Open Book can work across a range of sectors and can be scaled up or down depending on the size of the business. So my clients alone, I've had commercial laundry, hydroponic greenhouse, marketing firm, a architectural lighting design firm, a builder, a green builder. So yeah, I've seen manufacturing services, large companies, small companies. You know, Southwest Airlines has played great game of business, Harley Davidson, some very, very large companies. And then I've worked with tiny little companies. You might even have nonprofits. I know there's some big brother, big sisters organizations that have played great game. And there's even one county government. So Green County, Missouri has played great game and they've been able to do a ton more, save a ton of money uh, without tax increases. Ari even makes an argument that there are lessons to be learned around open book management that can and should be applied to everyday life outside of work. All these things that we do, visioning, energy management, servant leadership, open book, consensus work, I mean, all of these things are 100% applicable out of work as well as at work. So what most people in most businesses are taught is actually antithetical to the way they want to live. So you go to work and we teach you to compete, 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 dominate, dominate, dominate. And then you're supposed to go home and be kind and gentle. And and it wears on you. It's exhausting because you can't be yourself. So the greater ecosystem is benefiting. If you learn energy management, you take it home because bad energy at home is just as ineffective as bad energy at work. If you If you have a service mindset and you've learned how to internalize that, you take it in with your kids. So if you have a service mindset, it's much more likely you can take a deep breath and go, you know what, who cares who did the dishes more last week? It's completely irrelevant. We don't need to go to war over this. Let me just do it because it's the right thing to do. And in the long run, we're all going to come out ahead. So all of the stuff I realize that we're teaching people, the whole belief system, I mean, it's, it's, it's in an awesome way. It changes people's lives out of work. And because it's one ecosystem, the better they feel at home, the better they're going to do at work. So really, we all come out ahead. At the beginning of this episode, I said it was quite hard to define exactly what Zingerman's is. A community of food-related businesses? Yep. An Ann Arbor institution? Sure. But it's so much more than that. 
It's been a 40 plus year experiment into what it means to build a great business. For its open book philosophies, Zingerman's has created a thriving and motivating work environment where people are selling delightful sandwiches, making traditional Sicilian gelato, washing dishes, and also learning about business. You could almost call Zingerman's a business school. Open book management creates opportunities for people to grow. It enables each employee to make a positive difference and ensures everyone knows how a company is performing financially. And when you think about it, it just makes sense. To borrow the analogy Ari and Anne Claire shared with us, it's almost impossible for people to make sound decisions in their work if they don't know the score. This episode of Small Business Big Lessons was written by me, Ash Reed, script edited by my teammate Ariel Tannenbaum, and produced by Rowan Bishop at Message Heard. We're making this podcast because we believe in a different way to do work, and we want to share the stories of the businesses inspiring us. We also share our own story transparently over at buffer.com forward slash open. If this episode has inspired you or is helping you think about building your business in new ways, we'd love to hear from you. Tweet us at Buffer and head to Apple Podcasts to leave us a review. 